Good morning, and uh, I hope that I'll make this talk worth the wait. I apologize for, for missing yesterday, and thanks to all the folks who did their talks early. Um, my topic today is why we should share frames across our movement in order to amplify our impact. Um, Frameworks, as, as they mentioned, we're a nonprofit. We're based in Washington, D.C. We work nationally and increasingly internationally. And our mission is to help you um, achieve your mission. And we do that by bringing social science uh, methods to thinking really carefully about investigating uh, the best way to talk about social issues. We're a staff of about 30 PhD level uh, social scientists. I happen to be a linguist, um, as, she, as was mentioned, because if you understand how language works, we believe you can work language. The sociologists and political scientists on our staff are fond of reminding us linguists that it's not just about the words you use, but the structures that those words go into, our institutions, our media, gatekeeping practices, political decision-making processes, all those institutional factors matter as well. We keep hiring psychologists because I'm in desperate need of some free therapy, but um, otherwise, other than that, they help us think about how the mind works and how people process information. And then many of us are veterans of social campaigns. I came out of progressive education reform. Others of us have worked on immigration issues, drug policy issues, early childhood issues. And uh, the advocates really keep us honest, so we're not asking pointy-headed advocates academic questions, but really practical questions that can help folks like you when you need to uh, figure out an annual report title, redo your website, frame a tweet, or these days delete a tweet might be a better idea. Um, so uh, uh, before I go any further, I just want to offer a quick definition of what a frame is or what it means to frame something. It's making choices, sets of choices, about how a concept is presented, where to start, what to emphasize, how to explain it, and often, most critically, what to leave unsaid. Um, so I'll give you an example um, from another field of, of how we, we study this. So in partnership with uh, the leaders of aging organizations, so national organizations like AARP or the National Hispanic Council on Aging, um, they had asked us to think about how we can tell different and more positive stories about what it means to, to get older. And we started by figuring out, well, what are we going to call uh, folks in later life? And we ran an experiment uh, investigating Americans' associations with different terms like senior citizen or the elderly. Um, and we asked them, how competent do you think these people are? Asked them to rate it on a scale of one to five. My slides are running off the edge here, but just fill in, use your, your automatic brain uh, to fill in you know, the missing here. But here's what we found. We found that people rated senior elderly and senior citizen as least competent. They associated words like frail, sick, can't use a cell phone. And on this other end, um, we, we got older person and older adult, and those were, people had much more positive associations with those words. Things like, you know, self-sufficient, well-established in their career, you know, don't care what nobody think anymore, right? So those were more, more positive. But then we asked a second question. How old do you think these people are? And this is what we found. First of all, we can see that it scaled, right, the kind of the same way. The older you are, people thought the less, less competent you were. But they also had in mind for this idea, the most competent one, older adult, someone much younger, right? This is the AARP. They're really focused on, you know, ages 60, you know, 65 and up. The range for this, this is the average. The mean was 54. The range was crazy. People put in numbers as low as 30. And if you stop to think about it, okay, younger adults are in their 20s, older adults, they're in their 30s, right? That, it's, it's not illogical. Um, so, but, we, but by not just asking what people think, but how they came to that conclusion, how they are thinking about an issue, you can find out a little bit more. In this case, we ended up recommending to the field that they use the term older people, older person, older Americans, older Tennesseans, something like that, because it brings both to mind the, the age group that they're trying to talk about and brings in these associations of competence and, and uh, self, you know, sufficiency. So that's one example. Another one um, is on the idea of, of talking about matters in a positive way or in, in uh, a more negative way. So I've got a battery here, the positive end and the negative end. We can talk about positive valence framing. If we do this action, something good will come of it. So for instance, when we ensure that our communities have the conditions for well-being, um, uh, uh, we will be able to increase racial equity versus a negative valence, which is if we fail to ta take action, we run this risk, right? Um, if we don't ensure well-being, then we're going to actually make racial disparities worse. 
as it turned out, this positive valence framing works really well for people who are already kind of um, on board with the issue, who, who, who believe in that issue, and that's much more effective for them to, to kind of mobilize them into saying, yes, yes, let's mo get moving. And this type of framing, if we don't do anything, we're likely to actually cause some harm. That is a more effective way of putting it for folks that maybe don't think policy matters, don't really, um, you know, are, are, are kind of more um, conservative in their thinking on an, on an issue. Uh, because they're like, well, wait, I was going to not do anything, but if I, my doing nothing is actually doing something and making the problem worse, and I don't want to do that, so let's do it, right? And so there's an a interesting kind of a frame effect there. So those are the kinds of things that we, we study. We do this um, because we think that frames matter. What we say as a social issue um, changes what people hear, and what people hear really shifts what they think. I think um, uh, the, uh, work, the, the talk this morning from the National Equity Project really showed that, right? The, thing, the number of times we hear something kind of creates those associations. Um, so by us talking, uh, saying effective things, we change what people hear, which changes what they think, and when the public understands an issue and can stand up to demand good policy, um, oppose bad policy, or at least not oppose good policy, right, then we've got a more hospitable climate um, and can, can, make, can make change. So that's our theory of change of, of why this matters. And we've done this work on, on lots of issues, particularly early childhood issues. So if you've heard the phrases brain architecture or toxic stress or the argument that we can invest now in, in young children or uh, pay more later in the form of increased social costs, those are all frame elements that come out of our partnership with the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child over the last 12 odd years. Uh, we've done this work on human services, on child mental health, um, on oral health, um, and it, 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 advocates really have found this to be very effective. And we've done a lot of this work in partnership here in Tennessee. It is a wonderful state to do this work because the, the relationships here, the connections here, and the organization that you all have, once you've got something, some, some frames, you, you really know how to move them. And so these are just a few of the, the partners that we've worked with here in Tennessee. Um, so through this work, I've got three lessons for you today. One, know the story you're in. Two, insist on evidence. And three, frame with friends. Let's start with the story you're in. Um, this, those psychologists gave me a, a little test to run on you all. Um, I'm glad we've warmed up on that already today. I'm going to show you a, I don't know, 75 second animation. It's silent. It's meant to be silent. I'm not having a tech meltdown yet. Um, and so this is a, uh, this was used in a study in 1944, and it's a little psychology experiment. Just, I'm going to play it for you and then see what you think, okay? All right, ready? All right, show of hands. How many of you made up a story in your mind as you were watching that? All right. How many of you, great, good, cognitively functioning, normal adults, I can continue with the talk. All right, that was, um, uh, how many of you had a bad guy in the story? And the bad guy was the big triangle, right? 
Yeah. All right. So this is one of the first studies done uh, to, to really investigate how is it that we come to judgments of others. It was a social psychology experiment. And they found that people did the exact same thing what y'all did. 97% of the people uh, came up with a story, often of individuals in conflict, and the bad guy was always uh, the big triangle, right? Um, Star-crossed lovers, Hansel and Gretel situation. Um, as I do this with social advocates, we often hear about bullying, domestic violence situations. Um, so these are all kind of kind of common uh, things that all of our, our brains fill in. But let's think about what's actually there. There's shapes of various sizes moving north and south at relatively different speeds. And that's it. That's actually all that's there, right? You can say, fair enough, that thing looks like a, a kind of a dwelling, so maybe you might think people are going in and out of a house. But people don't just say the triangle went in and out of this dwelling. They don't just go do the action, they get into the motivation, right? What is the need within that triangle or circle that created that thing? Is it blame, is it jealousy, is it anger, is it rage, is it fear, right? And so there's a, the point is that this, there's a story there, whether or not you're telling it, right? The human mind is hardwired to fill in and make meaning from very little information very faint cues. And so if people are doing all of that with triangles and circles, what are the stories they're filling in when we start to talk about child outcomes, childhood adversity, difficult issues um, uh, like maltreat, you know, when there's issues of child maltreatment, when we've got structural issues that are holding some communities back and, and, and helping others um, uh, disproportionately. So we need to be and really anticipate not only what do we want to say, but what are people already, what's the story they're already telling on this issue? So I'm gonna show you another little video. And this is, um, these are interviews that we did here, our researchers did here in the state of Tennessee about two years ago. And we pulled people, you know, invited them, stood on the street and said, will you talk to us for 10 minutes for a $10 Starbucks card? And, Tennessee people like some caffeine, so we got a lot of folks. And, um, and we just asked them, what do you think? Why do some kids turn out well, others don't, right? What's going on with, with some of those issues? And here's what we heard. So see what you can notice the patterns here. What comes to your mind when you think about children's development? I don't know, I haven't really thought about it. Man, <laughs> you stopped me, you stopped me. Well, it's hard to pinpoint what's going on. I think it depends on the day. Whenever I see a child, I can be like, oh, you're doing, you know, like, they're so cute, they're great. Because you never know how children's going to turn out. What do you think determines how well a child develops? The parents. I guess the parents would have the most to do with it. How your parents raise you. Family and the way they're brought up and the morals that the family has. How they're brought up with, like, their actions. The parents are the first teachers. The parents are the, the child's first teacher. Of course, learning starts from home. It starts with the home, you know, you gotta have a good upbringing. Home life and surroundings. Home situations. The children are a reflection of their household. It, environment may be a part of. Who they see and what they're doing and how they're doing it. It's a learned thing. Children absorb so much so quickly. They see the, the adults in their life portraying that and they follow. They're gonna mimic. Um, the individuals that, uh, that are bringing them up, that are raising them. A uh, child to see that, so it'll yeah, follow example. Mimicry from parents. Got the children imitate their parents. What do you think could be done to improve things for children here in Tennessee? Parenting classes. Classes in educating parents. You know, really educating parents. Education to parents. You know, a lot of parents. Media, as, as, as Hugh just showed you, through media, through um, ongoing um, uh, entertainment, hearing it at the baseball field, you know, your parents telling you these things. So these are, are deeply held cultural models. They're the ideas, they're what people have learned about your issue, even if they've never heard of it. But number one thing, who's responsible for kids? Parents, right? So this is that's what the, the 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 dominant idea there. But there's a little bit more there. So one is this idea that we started off with the black box, the assumption that people are like, huh, child development? I don't I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what I can say about that, right? So people don't have a way to grasp what it is. They don't have a way to think about the process that affects children. So that spot, though, that, that's, that, that I don't know. It doesn't stay open, right? People fill in the story, like you just did with the 
triangles and the circles, and people fill in individual actions, right? So uh, the, the, the willpower, the values, the characters, the um, effects and the actions of the parents. Um, if you get talk, start talking about little, doesn't take, they don't have to get that much older for people to start filling in those decisions to the child, ascribing the, the, the decision to the child themselves. Um, and then finally, when you say, what are we gonna do about it? A solution that people often come up with, well, hmm, I don't know how it works, but, I see, I, but I'm pretty sure it's individual actions. How would I affect individual actions? I would give people more information so they can make better decisions, right? And so that idea that just giving the information is the solution, not a solution, but the solution to lots of social problems. And when it comes to thinking about issues of equity and disparity, you can see, um, it didn't come through on this video super clearly, but you can see pretty quickly how that individualism, that, that it's, it's all up to the individual, gets kind of grown across thinking about a whole community. So when it comes to people, when we start to ask people about um, how they think, why they think racial disparities exist, first they say, well, those folks just weren't finding their bootstraps, right? That, that across that community that's not doing well, uh, these are, it's a, it's, a, it's a lots of folks, right, with those personal failings. Um, and it has to be personal failings because of another assumption is that we solved racism in the 60s, right? All done. We just saw this morning that that's not, we're not quite there yet. Um, and in the sense that, that, that black communities in particular, when we ask these questions, but it can, it can be, uh, it can happen to, uh, can be broadened uh, to, to lots of, of communities of color, right? That there's, a, there's some pathology in those communities, the idea that those communities are collections of, of folks that have a lot of bad values and bad decisions. And so it's like that individualism, but kind of, of brought out to the culture. And then there's a sense, well, if it's hmm, folks that aren't making good choices, and it's not a structural issue, what can we do, right? And so you saw that, the woman very fatalistic, I'm not sure there's anything we can do um, to, to change outcomes in general, but we can also see this, even folks that don't, if you've, if you've kind of moved past this, this is not your cultural models, you're not thinking about individual actions or flawed communities, you can also have a fatalistic response there, like, huh, well, racism didn't get solved and it's such a big problem, what can we do? Right? So there's that, that, that model that we can see uh, lots of folks hold that one. So this is the guessing machines in action. This is, these are the stories people are filling in. Um, uh, it's important to change those understandings, particularly uh, because, as Dr. King reminded us, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. So as we talked about before, the, the values, people's values may, may be in the right place, but if they don't have an understanding, if they don't have a way to think about this, then we kind of are leaving them where they are. So how can we change their minds? That's the work the second part of the work we do at Frameworks. And I'm gonna to get to some tips for changing minds, but first I'm gonna ask you, there's a few things not to do when you wanna change folks' minds. Uh, and this is where we need to insist on evidence. So, one thing people try, you know what? I'm gonna tell people where they're wrong. Now, when people tell me I'm wrong, I stop, take a breath, I listen deeply, I deeply internalize that corrective feedback, and I change for all time. And I'm pretty sure you guys all do that too. But other people, other people outside this room don't do that. So this is a, um, there, but we, we, we often communicate as if that is how people change their minds. A myth fact sheet is an example of that. This is a, a, a slide, a, a handout that was given out by the CDC. You don't need to be able to read all of this as long as you can kind of see that it's myths and facts. It's about the why you should get the flu vaccine. Example, the flu shot can cause the flu. Myth, the flu shot can cause the flu. Fact, the flu shot cannot cause the flu with a little explanation. Um, I don't mean to pick on the CDC because, well, number one, they're generous funders of the Frameworks Institute, um, but number two, because everybody does this, okay? This is a ubiquitous kind of social change communication structure. It's so ubiquitous that researchers at the University of Michigan decided to study it and see what happens when you give people one of these nifty little myth fact sheets. So they handed them to people, took them away, gave them a quiz, followed up with them a couple days later, and here's what they found. Number one, people misremember the myths as true. And you get the exact opposite of what the intention is here. Number two, 
Um, uh, it got worse over time. So they, you know, uh, when they followed up with them a couple days later, their misperception had actually increased. And thirdly, and most terrifyingly of all, people attributed the false information to the CDC. So they're saying, no, 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 I read this thing from the CDC and it told me if I don't get my flu shot by December, don't bother. Now, why is that? It's not that people are willfully stupid. It is not that we live in a post-fact era. This, this study was done, you know, uh, 15 years ago at this point. It's about how the human mind works, right? So myths are myths because people have heard them so often. They have a cognitive reality in the mind. There's a little synapse right there that holds it, right? A little, little neural network that holds it. And what you have done with this is taken your orange fact, lit up that circuit, reinforced it, given it another rep, and then you want your sad blue fact to overcome a lifetime of experience and expectation. That's not going to work. So all of this is a lot of neuroscience to give you one important framing lesson, which is never remind people of something you want them to forget. Number two, providing more and more data doesn't work. We often create our communications like this. I've got some numbers. I've got that awesome person down the, down, the, down the other end of the office who knows how to work PowerPoint smart art to make it pretty. I've got another study, like that study that came out last week that totally proves the point I've been trying to make all along, and I add that, because if I do all this, if I have all this data and I put it in front of people in a compelling way, this is going to happen, epiphany, right? That doesn't work either. People dress naked numbers in their own stories. Facts can help, and we want to be grounded in facts, but how we present the facts matters more. Without giving people some meaning, they make their own meaning from it. Like this one, 26,000 kids of primary age kids were admitted to hospital last year because of tooth decay caused by sugar. This is a little social media tile put out as Jamie Oliver was doing a, um, a sugar expose, sugar doc documentary um, in England. And from some, from some metrics, this is a pretty successful communication. It had 712 retweets and 377 favorites until you look at not just did people hear it and like it and notice it, but what did they think? What did it do to their thinking? And we can see that in the reactions. So the first kind of response to it pinned right up there for all those 722 people to see. So tooth decay because of sugar and neglectful parents, forgot that part, right? So that family bubble thinking, that all on the individual decisions in the home. Next person, drink water, take responsibility for educate, 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 cook homemade food, drink water. So that's that information, right, for, for a thing, for a solution. It's impossible to admit sugar from kids' diets, fresh juice or whatnot. What can we do? Fatalism, right? Versus I don't take sugar is I hate sweet things. So fatalism for them, I'm good. So cocooning right there. Uh, next one, I refuse to give my sons drinks which contain aspartame and sweeteners in them. X, check. I have literally checked off that social problem because I have done my individual responsibility. Um, or a consumerist response. Uh, brush baby tweet, we can help with the toothbrushing. Take a look and you can buy little baby toothbrushes, right? Consumerism. We've got one person with a structural view here. Well done, but good luck. I've worked in special care dent dental services for 27 years and there's a year long waiting list. Good luck. So the one person with a structural view, fatalism, right? So numbers can help, um, but they, they need to be nested in stories, and I'll get to that. But one other thing that, so people will um, use the, the, if the facts don't fit the frame, the facts go and the frame stays, right? People didn't kind of get what this meant, and so they fell back on the stories that they, they filled in their own stories. The other thing that can happen is people may agree with the stories, but then you get, uh, uh, understand the numbers and, 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 and kind of say, okay, I see that but you get this kind of feeling, right? If you don't recycle Susie, the earth will heat up, the oceans will explode, and boiling rain will scald all the baby animals. Any questions? Poor Susie, the weight of the world on her shoulders, right? So a lot of those, too many of those stark statistics, um, we, we use them to kind of create a sense of urgency and a sense this problem has to be dealt with now, but a lot of social science shows us that there, the public has compassion fatigue. There is a finite pool of worry, and if our only move is to kind of get people worried, we're draining that pool of concern rather than replenishing it. So there are alternatives, but we can't do myth busting, can't count on the numbers. The other thing we can't do is guess. All right, I'm gonna show you a bar graph, you ready? Okay, all right. 
Take a breath, it's gonna be okay. All right, so across this line is gonna go different messages we tested. If the bars go up, that means people got more supportive of the policy of something. And if the bars go down below this, this here, it means people got less supportive. We tested, uh, we were working with folks in Australia to translate the science of parenting, the science of good parenting. Uh, what is it that happens in the adults and in our interactions between um, adults and, and infants um, that makes makes children develop and grow and, and thrive and there's a there's a, a science that many of you probably know that science and there were two different ways that we could have talked about it we could have talked about it as effective parenting or we could have talked about it as what children need to, to thrive you have a guess of which one worked better right Effective parenting makes people, if you talk about it as effective parenting, people are less likely to support doing any of the stuff that you think is, in, is effective parenting. But if you talk about it as what children need, people got, uh, you know, t there was a, a 10 point increase in, in how supportive they were. That's a 15 point swing right there. Our interpretation of that is easy for this one. Um, but uh, in general, you, you know, it's really important not to guess, not to assume that the first thing that comes to your mind, well, people are interested in parenting information, right? You need to always um, kind of check uh, before you do that. So um, no myth busting, no uh, killing them with numbers, and uh, no guessing. So what can we do? A different approach. Um, the brain story, which you've heard on display these last two days, can work. Um, this has got a, it's a story that isn't, a it's not a bedtime story. Uh, it's a story of how a social issue works. And, and, and you can uh, out outline it like this. Start off by telling people why this matters to society. They need a, a public a reason that this is a public issue, not just a private problem, in order to set them up to think about public collective solutions. Um, so one value that can work for that, um, uh, one message that can work for that is to talk about how today's children are the basis for tomorrow's shared prosperity. There are other ways to open that story, but that's one we found to be particularly effective on children's issues. Um, then people need a way to think about what it works. If you can change the structure of their understanding, right, what's the metaphor they're using to think through that, then you can get them to think about different sorts of things than the stories they already know, which is it's, you know, bad parents versus good parents. Instead of making it about people, make it about the process. It's about brains being built like a house from the bottom up, and so those foundations really matter. Um, Every story needs a bad guy. I'm not going to dwell on this uh, bad guy in the story today because I know there were some great talks about it yesterday. But one villain kind of in the story is, is, can be toxic stress, the idea that some community were channeling stress into some communities in some areas, and that really creates a, a biological reaction that can uh, disrupt uh, learning cognition and other sorts of things. And then, we remember we talked about we don't want to overwhelm people, so it's important anytime you raise a social problem, you need to raise a, a social solution. They can't leave those out. Uh, let's move forward and check on proven approaches and explore promising new ideas. So I'm going to go a, a little bit into a couple of the chapters of these stories, um, and then uh, go up. Who's, who's got my time cards? Anybody show me? How am I doing? All right. Um, so the beginning of the story, um, Thanks. Um, is to lead with uh, these themes of shared prosperity or ingenuity. Um, the idea that today's children are, are tomorrow's kind of the basis of a bright tomorrow, that's, that's one way you can uh, uh, test that, another, or express that. Another is this idea of ingenuity or innovation, the idea that we can think smarter, think differently, take new, bold, interesting, creative ideas to problems that have been around for a long time. People really seem to respond to that, particularly if they're problems they think we can't make a difference to, just telling people there's a solution um, often, uh, and we can be creative about it, often breaks through uh, that. We have found that the, on children's issues, the message of prevention um, not, is, is it's the same as saying nothing statistically, basically, um, that it's, you should keep doing prevention work, keep doing prevention work, but in terms of why does this matter to society? Um, it doesn't collectivize the issue, right? If you just say, we can, well, we can get in there earlier. I'm like, well, how do you get into people's homes earlier? They think, you know, on prevention on oral health, people think it means, you know, brush earlier in the morning, right? So uh, it, it, is, it doesn't collectivize the issue. And this idea of talking about how vulnerable our children are, yes, they are vulnerable, and yes, those of you that are looking at data and, and deploying programs that are gonna target the most vulnerable, please keep doing that work. But in terms of messaging, 
talking about we're protecting vulnerable children doesn't work. People hear vulnerable children as extra bad parents, right? And so uh, it's not helpful for that way. And so giving up to boost support for vulnerable children, this kinds of messaging, these pictures of vulnerability or call it that word uh, is actually, um, we found to be counterproductive. So lead with a, a value that makes it a collective, positive kind of issue like prosperity or ingenuity. And then, uh, how would that look? It would be something like this, that you can either talk about pointing to the crisis ahead or preparing tomorrow's leaders, how are we doing? You could talk about child poverty or homelessness being on the rise, or you can talk about challenges that call us to work harder and smarter, right? That's a way to do um, ingenuity. So same idea, right? Very different framing is gonna lead to a different response. Second part of the story is explanation. Uh, Frameworks believes that explanation is so important that we're actually dedicating our whole 20th anniversary year this year to exploring this idea. And we have found that metaphors are one, one particularly strong way, not the only way, but one particularly strong way to do explanation of social issues. If you get the comparison right, and we spend several months and, and a lot of intellectual um, effort to, to test um, and make sure we've got the right comparison, but if an apt comparison channels people's attention to some things, which then doesn't have them thinking about the things they, they had in mind before, much like that bear walking, uh, moonwalking bear, right? So if I'm telling you this is about the brain and, and happening uh, in earliest stages and it's about activity that's happening, you're less likely to be thinking about failed parents or um, you know, cultures of poverty sort of thing. I've channeled your attention to this one thing. They have priming effects. And metaf people love metaphors. They like to extend them. So they are a way for your message to travel through society. Um, this metaphor of brain architecture, I know you all have been using it quite a bit, so I won't dwell on this, but the, the design features of it is that it gives people, by talking about brain, the, the uh, brain being built like a house, foundation first, um, you've gotten people away from this idea that early doesn't matter, right, till they can remember it doesn't really matter, you've, you've, you've really established the foundation, um, you've made it active, and it's a process, and lots of people build a house, so you've gotten out of that individualism. Um, a little bit. I'm going to show you some video of how people in Tennessee responded um, to when, when, oh well, I'm going to show you that next, sorry. First I'm going to show you how to do this in, in communications. So instead of talking about the contribution of early childhood to healthy development and, and the future well-being of children who are disadvantaged and just saying it's a vital issue with implications for everyone and we can, if we do this, we can have some long-term effects. All of this is true, but there's no how in there. There's nothing explanatory. People don't have a sense of, well, why does this money make a difference if you haven't done anything to dislodge their story of parents cause outcomes and that's it. Instead, um, without, uh, instead of using that uh, mystery process, leaving that a mystery, you can give people a process with brain architect architecture. So you can say just like a house is built in phases, starting with a strong foundation, the human brain develops in stages. A child's early years are an intense period of brain development that lays the foundation for future growth. So you've told me how. Uh, public investments can provide important resources for this construction project, especially for communities, uh, children for communities with fewer opportunities to learn. And then why does it early matter? Because it's er easier to build a strong foundation than correct later on, this makes, this pays off. When exposed to that kind of messaging, people in Tennessee have sounded very different than the folks in the first video. So I'm gonna let you hear this and compare the two. You've gotta make sure that that base is correct. So then you start building the house on the way up. And then when you get to the top, it'll all be square. You put that roof on, you won't have a problem with it. You're growing and Bob's like building the house, putting the wood down, putting the concrete in the ground, building blocks for the architecture to, you know, want to learn or want to be a certain type of individual or person. Your parents start talking to you and you're in school. The house is continuously being built. So people still have this idea, they, have, they, they, they want more stuff in the construction project, right, to ask people to kind of go further along. Finally, uh, the end of the story is that there's hope, right, in your, in your framing. Uh, we found that using the, the including solutions frames 
um, whether that's a solution that you've got great data to show it really, really works, or it's one of these innovative ideas that you want to borrow from elsewhere. So it can be proven or um, promising, things that will make a difference. If you talk about these, it will, it will have a, a really big effect on people's um, uh, ability to engage, right? So they don't feel like Susie with the weight of the world on their shoulders, but rather are more interested um, in doing this. So I'll give you an example of how you can build in more solutions framing on this very important topic of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So a typical communication goes like this. Adverse childhood experiences are traumatic and they include things such as verbal, physical, and sexual abuse, as well as forms of family dysfunction, such as growing up with a mentally ill family member or a family member who is substance abusing witnessing domestic violence as a child, having a family member incarcerated, or having your parents be separated or divorced. Oh, I am feeling very Susie right now, right, after hearing that. A 2010, study CDC in five, a 2010 CDC study in five states found that more than half of respondents reported some type of adverse childhood experience that continues to affect them today. Wow, so that's a big problem with a lot of heavy stuff, and it's everywhere is what you can kind of get from this. We need to talk about ACEs. We can talk about ACEs in a way that invites people to want to engage in solutions rather than just kind of feel bad about the whole thing. And here's an example of the change. Instead of that, try this. Adverse childhood experiences are common and harmful. They include things like the death of a parent or growing up in a household with a mentally ill family member. I just picked two of them. I didn't list all 10. And I picked two that were kind of more life lottery right? Because I know that people will fill in bad parents. So I, I ch purposefully chose which two to mention here. Since a 2010 study found that more than half of Americans in five states reported the effects of ACEs, this work is a clear priority. Fortunately, there are known ways to improve the environments where young children develop and to buffer damage that has already occurred. Now, I didn't even say what the solution was. I just said there was a solution. And turns out that, that sometimes can work, and just doing that uh, can be enough, and I'll show you a little evidence of, of that. Um, this is a, a study that we did in England. We tested, uh, we were talking specifically about child maltreatment, uh, uh, physical neglect, uh, physical abuse, uh, neglect, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And we tested three different messages. The first one was this idea of social responsibility, so that leading with the value. And it was, we all have a, we have a shared obligation to Britain's children. And just saying that, led people to support a lot of the policies they want. Is, this, is child maltreatment a big problem? Yep. Is, do we need to fix it? Yep. Can we make a difference? Yep. People didn't think about it as a public issue necessarily or would they take action, but it's moving in the right direction. We then gave them a second message which had two parts. The value, we have a shared obligation to Britain's children, and the fact, one in five have experienced some form of maltreatment. And that was the whole message. Lost support. Right? And nothing was statistically significant. That was the same as saying nothing from a messaging point of view. We gave him a third message. Had three layers in it this time. We have a shared obligation to Britain's children. One in five have experienced some type of maltreatment. And in every, are they shires? In every shire in England, there is a hotline uh, that you can call to figure out if you, if you think a child is experiencing maltreatment. So a very simple solution. And here, and you can't, can you see it here? Yes, okay, so you get your whole agenda. It can, it's more effective, right, than just saying the problem, saying that there's a solution uh, made a big difference. So if you are missing a solution in your message, even a nod to a solution, you're really leaving, that, uh, leaving some people out of the conversation. All right, so know the story you're in, insist on evidence, um, then that's some evidence that, that I would want you all to not just look at this evidence, but really ask, right, demand that you have something to know, something to go on before you start messaging things. We're long past the point as a nonprofit sector that we would just make up a program based on how we feel. We need to be at that same point. Um, or what we think would work, we need to be at that same point when it comes to our communications and really insist that there's some data behind what we're saying. The final point is framing with friends. Um, the, uh, the history of the scholars who have studied social movements have shown that the difference between social movements that take off and reach their goals versus those that fizzle and go away and nobody ever hears of again is the difference is whether or not that movement had a shared effective frame or not. Um, so movements are engaged in meaning work, 
right? Meaning making work, not just the work work. You're, you're in a struggle over the production of ideas. And if you are not seeing traction on your issue, right, the failure of mass mobilization when otherwise it seems like it should be happening, uh, scholars suggest that you're looking, that you should look to whether or not you're framing that issue in an effective way. I have this picture of um, the, the Southern struggle for civil rights for African Americans here purposefully because this is a movement that actually gave us some ideas that have that worked for that movement but haven't carried forward into future movements. So when you have an effective frame, you're doing your own work um, good, but you're helping future folks uh, uh, make, make progressive social change as well. So the idea that if one of us is not free, none of us is free, and, and everyone, we are all brothers and sisters, right? That, that core, those core frames in the uh, struggle for African-American rights was brought into the, the struggle for marriage equality, struggle for black, you know, black Lives Matter work now. Um, so those core ideas can be the women's rights movement. They will be used again and again and again. So if the children's movement can really get in some ideas that are core ideas that help people understand how, how our, what surrounds us shapes us and what we can do to create a society that brings forth um, the full potential of children. If you can frame those ideas effectively, you're, you're making your work easier now. You're offering a gift to feed those that will come after you. Um, and so the challenge is to, uh, we see our work at Frameworks as offering some ideas about what those frames are and offering some evidence as to why that's a, a good way to talk about it as opposed to something else. Your work, I would challenge you, is to take your field from communicating like this where everyone kind of makes it up and goes their own way and says what they think sounds good and might work with that audience. Um, and, and the effect on public thinking is kind of, you, don't, you haven't taken advantage of the power of repetition, right? It's just kind of splintered. People, no wonder the public is confused. Can you take your field from sounding like this to at least being a little bit more like this, where it's not a script, it's not that you're all saying the exact same three words, it's not a bumper sticker solution, but are you talking about the, the, the process of human development, right? The development of brains as opposed to effective parenting or something else, right? Can you make the same general um, sense site, sorts of, of ideas um, and, and bring those to your audiences? Can you agree on what is not helpful to say anymore? Can you, can you, can you decide what's the boundaries around uh, effective frames? Because some words, some things you might say, it's, it's undermining all of you. Um, if you can do that, then the difference is um, in, your, in your work, in your coalition, um, you can move from your influence being diluted to your influence being concentrated. The number one predictor of whether or not people will believe something is the number of times they have heard it. So if you all can, can share your frames and share effective frames, you're going to have a much bigger, much more powerful effect through your communications. And if you do that here in Tennessee, I just want to assure you that this is part of a global narrative shift in project in progress. This idea of this shift from um, it's all about vulnerable kids to it's all about developing brains is work that's being used globally um, in lots of, of different contexts. And I think we'll see um, the, the effect. We have already seen many effects from that, and I'm excited to see what other policy changes will come with that greater attention. Um, so I'll just, I'm, that's my, my, Second to last thing to say, the last thing I'll say is I want to read you this quote from Larry Wallach, who worked in, works in public health. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, quite, it's from 1993, so it's been around for some time, um, but I find that it resonates with people who are doing the hard work of social change. The advocate's message tends to be complicated rather than simple, longer rather than shorter, and contrary to rather than consistent with popular understanding. For the most part, this means that we have to explain our opponents just have to state, we need to change people's minds, they just need to reinforce what people already think. We need to emphasize shared responsibility, they just need to highlight personal choice. And although he was talking about public health, um, I find that this is a, a, a quote that people who are doing the hard work of social change recognize in their own work and their own interactions with the public. So if you feel like talking about really getting people to understand what it means to advocate for children, what it means to create a Tennessee where all children can thrive, if you feel like that work is hard, 
It's because it's hard. Uh, you are, by definition, if you're creating social change, you're by definition doing something countercultural. But the tools of cultural change are within our grasp. We can name them, we can identify them, we can study them, we can know what they work, and we can use those tools to build the Tennessee that we want. So I want to um, challenge you all to keep, keep, keep talking, keep talking effectively, and most of all, frame on. Thank you.